Hello, and welcome to Deprogrammed on Unsafe Space. I am your host, Carrie Smith, and I'm joined today by a lovely human named Jason Littlefield. Jason is an educator who's passionate about the health and well being of individuals and the preservation and restoration of human liberalism. He is the executive director of Empower ED Pathways and author of the Compassionate Humanism Framework for Life, Leadership and Learning. You can follow him on Twitter at Jason the Human, and that's the with two E's, so Jason, T-H-E-E, Human. And you can also find his YouTube channel under Jason Littlefield. Jason, welcome to Unsafe Space. Thank you for having me, Carrie. Been looking forward to this for a while. Me too. I've, I've, uh, I'm not going to say where you're located, but you are located in Texas. And so I yes. feel an, an affinity for you because you're someone who's here fighting for liberal values in my great state. <laughs> and that makes me feel uh, very happy, very warm towards you. Well, and I feel the same towards you. Uh, you know, your, your story, uh, really, helped me to start kind of seeing things, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a few years ago, like, oh, yeah, I'm not the only one yeah. that's seeing this and that's going through this. And so I am I would like to automatically extend some gratitude towards you because uh, well, it's not you. easy. It's not easy coming out, you know, of yes. the ideological <laughs> closet, so to speak, and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, I'm. I'm just not a Marx, you know, I'm not into that. I'm not, I'm not into that. This isn't for me, guys. I think right. that I, I know exactly what you're talking about, that feeling of, of realizing, oh, it's not just me. There's other liberals who are seeing this. It's You, you don't have to be a, a conservative or some kind of right wing boogeyman to be opposed to social justice ideology. You Liberals, I, I believe liberals should be opposed to it by definition, because it's not liberalism. It's a so, it's a direct attack on the individual, you know, yes. it's it's so I'm like, well, this is not this is not what we think it is. Right. So just to give people some broad strokes of your journey and where you're at now, um, you caused a bit of a stir online recently with you have a, a on your YouTube channel, Jason Littlefield, you did an open letter Dear Public Education, I have a few requests. First of all, I love that you did an open letter to all of public education. <laughs> that makes me think of the Bible. It's like, dear Ooh. Corinthians, like the whole town. Or right. the way that social justice people address like an entire race of people. They're like, dear white people. Right. And so you took a page from that. You said, dear Public education. Public education. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I feel that we're not engaged in the in conversations that we need to be engaged in. Uh, and I believe that we're using really ineffective tools uh, to solve our greatest uh, issues. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about your whichever you want to start with first, your journey. I guess to waking up to some of the ideology that's now being pushed in public schools, if you want to start there, and then you can tell us about what you said in that video. Okay, for sure. Uh, <clears throat> so probably around 2010, uh, we started, you know, looking at data and having having conversations about race. Uh, in your school district? In, in my school district. Uh, and I noticed that the conversations really never, you know, never ended up going anywhere. So I started looking into some of the origin, like, okay, well, what's, what's going on here? And then around 2011, uh, just the whole social justice movement. And back when, you know, I'm sure you remember it from your journey back when social justice warrior was the not an insult, you know, that was right. the badge of honor. So right. around 2011, I, I saw this ideology globally like forming and I saw it as, okay, this is, this is a way of remaking uh, American culture, Western culture, and even reshaping uh, global culture. Um, you could know, you and I, it? could you see it as that in 2011? I could. Uh, well, in fact, so, so much so I decided that, uh, 
this I had to leave. Uh, I was also at a at a point in my life where I, you know, my marriage was a little rocky, if you will. I had four mm-hmm. small children. Uh, professionally, we're engaging in these practices that are going nowhere and that are not fruitful. And I didn't want my children growing up in the postmodern critical theory, just like mm-hmm. destructive nihilistic world that that this idea ideology brews right right so we made the decision to leave the country uh that's how for sure i was is like i'm I'm not a part of this i i can't push forth this ideology uh i can't really participate in in this system and because i see it for this destructive thing that it is so wow so you actually made that decision uh you know and what what i learned is that what what god has planned for you and what you think you're going to do are two different things uh because i am that journey uh that forever journey uh only lasted one year uh due to many other circumstances um i spent some time in china and i spent some time in benin africa and those experiences uh really shaped me forming those deep human relationships with people from all over the world and really embracing our our shared humanity really experiencing it and embracing it uh you know and i i have recently heard matthew mcconaughey talk about uh his experience in africa and just how it made him feel. And I got that same feeling in that place. But I was gonna ask, where was it in Africa? Where were you located again? In Benin, which is a little tiny, yeah, little tiny country between Nigeria and Togo. Oh, wow, okay. I spent If you look at the, the world index of like healthy countries or third world poverty, Benin is, right down there at the at the bottom so to speak but uh what a wonderful place what wonderful people and it was in my moment there uh leaving benin obviously not planned but i actually sat down and just opened myself up and paused and really tried to figure out what was next for me because and it was kind of then that I decided, I was like, you know what, I'm not going to, I'm not going to run from what's happening. I'm going to go back home and I want to have conversations with people. And I want to continue to uh, bring society and humanity forward. Because as an educator, I always said, I, I feel like I have a moral obligation to those that I serve now and to the future of, of humanity. So it was <clears throat> after I came back, uh, you know, I eventually became a social and emotional learning specialist in the public school system. Social and emotional well, learning specialist. Yeah. And I saw that as like, oh, wow, this is this is an actual thing in our schools where we are teaching the individual, where we are teaching self-management where we're teaching self-awareness, where we're teaching relationship skills and really fortifying the individual. Um, Mm -hmm. So I began doing that. And then around, so I'll say around 2017, Mm -hmm. uh, around 2017, I started noticing the shift uh, in the culture at large, uh, the Berkeley riots, were kind of yep. happening uh evergreen with bread yep. you know that kind of blew up the Yale. color the costumes at Yale mm-hmm. yeah and also around that time I started attending uh these these trainings um and what the first training I went to during the introduction piece uh the main facilitator was given the origin of the of the company and it was 
founded, as they said, by a direct student of Sal Alinsky. And wow. I was like, Interesting. And y'all are just, it, that's, I didn't really think that was a, a bragging point. Uh, but I knew that one of Alinsky's uh, famous quotes was the issue is never the issue. The issue is always revolution. Yeah. Uh, so after really going down, you know, I went to that. And then the next couple of years, these trainings and this messaging really became more and more uh, into my daily, my daily work. And I remember asking, you know, the questions that I asked in 2008, you know, like looking at data discrepancies and trying to figure out like why, you know, what's going on. Let's, let's address this. Uh, I asked like, in 2000. And do you mean like data discrepancies surrounding achievement and race and gender yes. and stuff? Okay. <clears throat> yes. Yes. Uh, so started asking questions again in 2016, uh, 2017. And I was always told we're, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And this past summer, we're looking at data again, and I asked the same questions, and I was told, you know, we're not there yet, we're not there yet, which just reinforces that we're using ineffective tools. So I really started, and then I guess uh, to kind of finish up my, my journey of how, since it's almost like a decade long, uh, around 2019, a couple of summers ago, I, I started going, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, to various people and saying, Hey, you know, this, what we're doing is, is rooted in Marxist, uh, philosophy and it is actually destructive to human nature, you know, being, being in that realm of social and emotional learning, you know, that's the war, that's the lens that I have viewed the world, you know, looking at human well being, uh, looking at what are, what are we, what are we doing? Uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, I was, that was before I realized just how illiberal, uh, I guess, the movement is because I figured people, you know, you go to people and have good faith conversations about, hey, I don't really know. But I was really uh, met with disgust. Wow. Uh, yeah. And Can I ha pause here for a second? So yeah, for sure. Your, your job is social and emotional learning, which as you said, is about fortifying the individual. And I, I, I assume making people stronger, helping people achieve, helping individuals achieve and meet resilience. their goals, resilience. And so when you look at this ideology that's being taught in these trainings now to educators and you say, wait a minute, this doesn't help with social and emotional learning. It doesn't help to fortify the individual. It doesn't help with resilience. It does the opposite. Is that the basis of what you were trying to explain to them? And they reacted negatively. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And, and, you know, so I, I understand that whenever we're met with information that, you know, it, things can kind of be like alarming, like, ah, what, uh, and over time I've even had somebody tell me like i think i get i get triggered when you say marxist is because that i i guess i'm on that side meaning the marxist side yeah but why would they, if they're that that's so interesting isn't it because if you are a marxist why do you oppose someone using the term right i there's and see that's uh there's a lot of confusion around this and you know i i feel so after and then i was you know trying to explain things and i was met with viciousness and then i was also met with well that's easy for you to say because you're a, a white male uh, you know you're a straight oh, racism and sexism yeah 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 that so, is one of their i'm sure you know this but when I, I was in this ideology that you're talking about, and anybody who's been watching our show for a while knows that, I was in it for about 20 years. 
And it's amazing. I know it's amazing for people who were never in it that it could take a person two decades to realize what this was, but it took me that long to realize, wait a minute, if we disagree with some, if there's someone who disagrees with our belief system, we're told to denigrate them on the basis of race and sex. <laughs> That's racist and sexist to say to you, Jason, this is because you're a white, <laughs> of course you'd have that opinion, you're a white man. Right. Well, it's, you know, it's uh, Marcuse's uh, repressive tolerance in action. You know, I'm sure that most of these people are, have no clue who Marcuse is and what repressive tolerance is, but it's this allowance for, you know, for pushback. Can you explain a little bit about what it is for people who don't know? Well, uh, basically, it, it allows the you know it sets it sets a moral tone to it's okay to uh not treat the oppressor in a in a dignified way right and whoever whoever the oppressor is you know and the thing is what i feel like people really haven't thought this completely through is that the ruling class uh can pick and choose who the oppressed and the oppressors are at any moment yes. in time, you know, yeah. it's a, it, like if, if this framework really becomes the norm for humanity in the next, you know, 100, 200, cause our, our great liberal experience lasted what, 300 years. So maybe mm -hmm. there'll be another 300 years uh, of this. Yeah. You know, groups change numbers and groups change and dynamics change. Uh, so I just find it interesting that if this is something that we push through and completely railroad through uh, the great liberal experiment, then. Because that is such a great point, because this ideology, social justice ideology, didn't come from the working class, just like Marxism wasn't pushed by the working class. It's It, it didn't come from... Uh, black and Latino communities, I would argue, even though feminism had a big uh, part in it, it didn't come from women. It came from a small minority of each of these groups. It came from feminists and it came from upper class, elitist, wealthy women who were in the feminist movement in academia. It came from women like Peggy McIntosh, who coined the term white privilege, who's, you know, one of arguably one of in one of the most privileged groups in America. And I don't mean her race or her, her sex. I mean, in terms of wealth and access to things, um, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it, it is not something that's coming from an ideology that's originating from and evolving from the so-called oppressed groups that it claims to speak for. It is, it started in these elite colleges. That's where right. It, Started. It's an elite well, it's, theology. <laughs> it's and you could even take it back that that it's not it's not even original to that. Uh, you know, I yeah. heard you say white privilege. White privilege. That term is being used uh, today in the West, just like Han privilege was in China in the Cultural Revolution. Wow. Yeah. You know, it's the same. Uh, Wait, like, how do we fuel shame and resentment uh, into society? And yeah. how do we cultivate that shame and resentment? And so another one of the other points that I've really been trying to raise is that the way that intersectionality, just take that that component of DEI practices, uh, really Real quick. Um, DEI for anyone watching doesn't know DEI is these diversity, equity, inclusion courses that they're pushing now, these courses and trainings. Go ahead. And so that's also kind of how I frame this whole movement. Uh, just my lane. I just refer to this whole movement as diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then I've even, uh, put the word orthodox in front mm -hmm. of it because yep. I do not want to uh, in any way seem like I am talking negatively about words like diversity 
uh, words like equity and words like inclusion, mm -hmm. because those words are extremely valuable to the health of a liberal society. It's just right now that we are using uh, an anti-liberal framework. So part of what I'm doing and we'll get to is to really introduce uh, a liberal framework for addressing uh, matters of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think that's great. And I would love to hear more about that because as you probably know, a lot of the people who've been pushing back against this ideology or trying to explain what it is, I think we've been in the explaining what it is phase for quite a while now. Right, and right. Tr trying to help people see it for what it is and trying to reach out, uh, myself anyway, trying to reach out to people who've been persuaded by some of the social justice tenants um, who've maybe adopted some of those beliefs and trying to show them that it's illiberal. So what you're doing is you're, you're at the next phase. You're trying yeah. to, yeah, you're trying to um, address issues of diversity inclusion um, with liberal framework. So can you tell yes. us a little bit, is that, is that your um, compassionate humanism framework? Yes. Yeah. And uh, let me, I, I thought of an analogy to kind of, because okay. I, I, I still don't think, so since I have I have been like in in the heart of this since about 2017, and I know a lot of people are just now mm -hmm. starting their journey uh, and doing the work. So I've doing the work. You use one of their doing phrases. The work. <laughs> doing the, some Sorry. people are on that journey, and just so you know. Uh, if anybody has started doing the work, it's just this constant turmoil, look inward with no hope or solution. So that's, that's what they mean when they say it. <laughs> that's what they mean. So I, I like to think of uh, human history as we're building a road, right? Started out, we started out with two people in the middle of a jungle, a jungle thicket. And over time, you know, more people, more workers, and we figure out how to clear the brush. Uh, and then, you know, let's say a thousand years into it, we were like, oh, you can actually put stone on the road. So over time, this road keeps getting more and more and more developed. And then about 300 years ago, we figured out, oh, we can build heavy machinery and asphalt, right? So about 300 years ago, and that represents the advent of Western civilization in my mind is that now we can really start building this road. And over time, you know, we get potholes, a little wear and tear in the road, and it's not so shiny and new anymore. Mm -hmm. So then there comes along this new idea, like, you know what? That road is terrible. Uh, the people that designed that road were terrible. They didn't know what they're doing. The machines that designed them are terrible. Uh, the best, the best road that we can build, we have to tear this one up, have to destroy this one. And then the, then the perfect road will emerge. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, and they're like, how do we, so in order to do this, we have to convince our people to destroy this road, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll figure out how to weaponize love and how to weaponize rage, and we'll give them these jackhammers. Mm -hmm. That's the only tool that we're going to give them is these jackhammers. And over, t over time, we get more people. So where we're at right now in the history of our world is that the majority of the people that are building our road, they're building it with a jackhammer. Wow. And, and with, with no plan for what to build. And so this ideology built on destruction. Now there's people that are involved in destroying the actual road. And then there's people that are involved in actually destroying the machines that built the road in the first place. Mm -hmm. And then there's people that are also into, we need to burn the books 
that talked about how to build the machine because yeah. it's corrupt from the onset. So we have this world, everybody is engaged in, in these tools of destruction. And if I could just identify the three of them, it's mm -hmm. critical theory. But, and I want to, I want to say critical theory, the 1937 idea, you know, there's a, there's a lot of talk about critical race theory today, you know, which is the ideological grandchild of critical theory. Uh, yeah. But it's the same, it's the same principle, right? And the reason why it is destructive is that, <clears throat> okay, Carrie, I'm going to give you this problem solving tool. And what it is, is you see the problem in every situation, <laughs> in every, every human relationship, every human interaction, and you have to see it everywhere. And yes. when you see it, you point it out. Yes. And on your other hand, you had to dream of utopia. Wow. And, and doing that together, that's critical theory. That's Horkheimer's, uh, you know, that's what critical theory is. And it was, it was purposed for destruction. Yeah. You know, it, the, it's a, to give people an example of this in current day, if your kids are in school and they're being forced to read Robin DeAngelo's White Fragility, which is a part of this whole social justice ideology, critical race theory stuff that we're talking about. Robin DeAngelo is one of the, uh, I, call them, I call them the high priests of the movement, the people who have a lot of power and influence and attention right now. She's one of those people. And she's one of the people who has said, the question is not, um, did racism occur in any given situation? The question is, how did racism manifest? It's a given. You have the answer from the start. That's what, that's what you're saying, Jason, is that they're telling you to see the problem in everything. And, and everything. You have to, in everything. And you have to figure out how to identify it in everything. So it's when I was being indoctrinated into this in college o over 20 years ago, um, a lot of the classes I was taking in women's studies, I took a lot of critical race theory classes, um, gender theory, queer theory. And in all of those classes, it was, um, for example, we, uh, one of the, one of the classes I took in queer theory, we watched, we watched movies and then we were to find the, these problems you're talking about in every single movie we watch. It's always there. So we would write, and I still have these papers I wrote about, watching like the movie Gilda, it was an old black and white film and uh, through the heterosexist gaze, you know, and you're trying to find the sexism and the racism and the homophobia in everything. And that's it's, developing yeah. a, criti a critical consciousness as they yeah. say it. And yeah. that's, that's the objective, you that know? Is, yeah. uh, and so what concerns me, where we're at now with this movement is that next year will be the year that it's really uh, put on kids. Like next, this coming next school year will be the, this, this, this is the year that this is really what we're teaching our kids. Yeah. And the reason why, why, why is that? Yeah. Uh, well, I've just seen the evolution, you know, of mm -hmm. where it comes, even from the uh, national social and emotional learning, um, what what's coming down the pike nationally. And, you know, I follow a lot of educator blogs, obviously, and educator articles and resources. Uh, so the illiberalness of this and these <clears throat> these tools. So that's critical theory. And then I, I want to get through the other the other tools uh, okay. that, we're, that we're passing on. Go ahead. Really, really quickly before you get to number two, with the, the, the first tool being critical theory to give also to give parents an idea of, of how this what this looks like in the classroom. Uh, we've heard from parents across the country is doing unsafe space who've, who've shared stories with us and shared curriculum with us and material from their kids classrooms. And I'm talking kids as young as kindergarten, you know, first grade, third grade, and 
the way that this is coming out in different classrooms, um, there are kids coming home and asking their parents, uh, why are white people bad? There yeah. are, <laughs> there are kids who are for their homework, having to list all of their different identities, like white and female and straight and cisgender, which is a new word they're teaching kids, which means that they're not trans. Um, and then they have to list all their privileges, do an accounting of all the different ways in which I'm privileged and all the different ways in which I'm marginalized because of these immutable characteristics. Kids are doing this. I mean, yeah. and there's more examples we could give, but um, that those are two that were just off the top of my head. So that, that's why I'm saying it's really uh, coming down on kids. And I heard you mention D'Angelo. So in her first book, she mentions that this that this movement is a rejection of human liberalism. Yeah. Like, wow. She, you know, it's not something that they that they keep uh, aside. And essentially, what that means, you know, is that the individual is the problem. Yeah. She actually, and in in the one that everyone is reading right now, all the all the soccer moms who've gotten sucked into social justice recently, the ones, no, I'm not saying soccer moms in general. I'm just saying, I see a lot of new people in social justice now that it's become culturally in fashion. And, and in some of these social justice groups, I mean, they're all reading Robin D'Angelo's white fragility. That's one of the ones they're reading. And um, she says in that book, you know, she, she, she for out the gate at the beginning of the book attacks individualism. They make no mm -hmm. bones about it anymore. They're collective. Right. They're right. collectivists, just like white supremacists. They believe your group status means more that, that you should be viewed as a group member and treated as such instead of viewed and treated as an individual. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, okay. So what's number two? What's the second tool they're using? So it's postmodernism. Uh, you know, just the just the overall philosophy to undo the enlightenment. Uh, and a pushback against truth and where we see that in uh, the current stage of diversity, equity and inclusion. So with critical theory, you know, we're, we're examining the problem. And then your next step as a human is to try to find solutions to that problem. Mm -hmm. Right. So whenever you start identifying and going to logic and reason, which are those enlightenment values. Uh, those are now deemed tools of white supremacy. Um, yeah. I've been to a lot of trainings uh, that talk about how logic and reason are white supremacy. And I'm like, no, these, they're not. These are That's trainers. True. These are trainings for educators. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, in fact, so kind of, Going back just a little bit, my final like breaking point, breaking point after, you know, a couple of years of like, hey, let's have these conversations and just get in the Heisman, you know, uh, for a couple of years. I, I said, you know, it's, what it boils down to for me is that this movement is a rejection of the Enlightenment and more importantly, a rejection of human dignity. And I was told it sounds like you want to go a different direction than we're going. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd like to keep the road. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I guess so. Uh, it's, that's fine. Uh, but just postmodernism, how it just drives this nihilism and destruction and everything is undoing, you know, undoing, dismantling, Mm -hmm. all of that. So deconstructing. also deconstructing. So back to that 2017 period and the Berkeley riots, uh, I started seeing, you know, Antifa and the, the actual physical destruction. And I was like, Oh, this mm -hmm. is the, these are the ones that are actually, you know, the militant, end of this yeah. ideology, if you will. And all of these, you know, throughout history, uh, I also studied history and was a history teacher. Throughout history, these this movement has has popped up. Uh, you know, I read a fascinating book I read last summer was The World in the Grip of an Idea. 
and I totally oh. forget who who wrote it. Uh, the world in the grip of an idea. Yeah, and it goes through. Uh, the, you know, Marxism and collectivism throughout time of what it is. And one of the things that he said was Marxism is the religion of socialism mm. and it justifies and sanctifies our most demonic urges. <sighs> that and I was is, like, whoa. It's and so true. It was written in 76, you know, so long before anybody was using this current iteration of what we have, you know, but it, you know, it goes through the, the Bolsheviks and Mao and just the evolution of, of this idea of collectivism. It always has a deadly end, you know? Yeah, always. I have to read this book. Thank you for this recommendation. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of history. So what was cool? I read that, uh, which is a historical evolution of the idea, and uh, Gadsad's uh, parasitic mind, mm -hmm. which goes into a little bit more of like the neurology and pathology of the idea. And here recently, uh, your interview, I believe, was it Jeremy Slocum? Was Josh that? Slocum. Josh Slocum, yeah. And just the rise of, of Cluster B personalities. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, we just handed over the the gates to the to collect to cluster B types. Yeah. His for anyone who hasn't seen that interview um that you're talking about, Jason, it's with Josh Slocum from the Disaffected Podcast, and he kind of there's a lot of different ways, a lot of different standpoints or if to use one of their words that you could use to look at this ideology. And he looks at it from the standpoint of someone who's very familiar with cluster B personality disorders and talks about how um, it, it's almost a lot of, a lot of the behaviors that have been identified as cluster B behaviors, this ideology props those up, incentivizes those behaviors supports them and it's just it's a really interesting show so yeah and it also i've seen uh some of those like personality character characteristic traits whenever people exhibit them mm -hmm. they they call that their whiteness what wait explain that like well uh i i'll see people exhibit, you know, uh, a character flaw, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then the, I guess, atonement or acknowledgement of that character flaw is that my bad, that was just my whiteness coming out. So when white people do it, you mean they say it was their yes. whiteness? Yes. Oh, so, instead of, instead of saying, Oh, this makes so much sense that they're doing that. I'm sorry, I'm getting animated. But yeah, yes, because they can never take personal responsibility for any character flaws or any, even when they have like Robin DeAngelo admits in her book that she was had racial prejudice and she can't take personal responsibility for that. It's much easier to say that's because I'm white and all white people are like this. Right. And so, of course, if they're exhibiting a character flaw, then they're like, uh, sorry, it's because I was white. It's because I'm white, right. all white people. Right. Or I'm you a know. man. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, that's my yeah. maleness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, you can't just uh, pawn off your character flaws on, on something that you're trying to get rid of. So th are, those are the, the first tools. The, and critical theory and postmodern, those are supposed to be ways of how do we continue humanity. But constantly seeing the problem and anytime you get to solutions you're like nope that's logic and reason and we can't use logic and reason yeah and then in the meantime we have to keep destroying uh so the third the third tool or strategy or idea that makes up uh the orthodox dei is intersectionality which 
It is essential, you know, Kimberly Crenshaw's, S, you know, 1989 essay, but it's really the fortifying and strengthening of uh, the Frankfurt School scholars, you know, back in 1923, you know, to look at really what the heck is intersectionality, you have to go back to 1923 when, uh, what, Horkheimer, Marcuse, you know, a lot of the those Frankfurt School scholars that were frustrated because revolution didn't happen, you know, or not actually not revolution didn't happen, but a united uh, proletariat revolution didn't happen mm-hmm. in post-war Germany, post-World War One Germany. You know, the country was in devastation. If there was ever a time for an uprising and revolution, that would have been it. Uh, mm-hmm. And then a couple of years prior with the Bolshevik revolution, mm-hmm. uh, it was not a unified proletariat revolution. So they got together and one of the things that they figured out was the problem was you have to have more than two groups because pr- traditional Marxism, you know, c- there's the proletariat and the bourgeois. Right. So these social, these Marxist social scientists got together and said, you know what, we, you need to divide society up into multiple groups and unite them against a single oppressor. And over time, they'll overthrow themselves. You know, that's yeah. how you, that's how you can get Western civilization. And that's how you get capitalism to destroy themselves is you organize them into groups and then for problem solving tools, you give them just these nihilistic uh, tools of destruction. Yeah. And, you know, the, that 1989 Crenshaw's reworking just really kind of solidified that. Yeah. So these ideas of, you know, we all inherited this world. That's the thing that people have to realize is that this is the world that we've inherited. Um, we can't help what generations previous to us did, but they set this thing in place many, many years ago. And so what intersectionality does, you know, uh, puts us into these groups, you're, and arranges us in order of uh, levels of oppression, right? Yeah, so it's, it's basically saying uh, the best way to look at the world is as a competition for power among various identity groups. And within each of these uh, categories of identity, there's an oppressor and there's the oppressed. And so, for example, when the category of race, white people are the oppressor and everybody else is the oppressed. And in the category of sex, men are the oppressor, everyone else is the oppressed. Sexuality, straight people oppressor, gay people oppressed. And, and it goes on and on. They've even started doing it now in, in, in different, this is why you see continual kinds of uh, um, categories of identity cropping up because you get social currency in this ideology, the more of the oppressed groups you check off, you get to speak more. You're not told to shut up. You're not denigrated for your identity the way you are if you're a white man. Um, so people are like, well, okay, so now one one category of identity is mental mental health. So people who have mental illness are the oppressed, and people who don't are the oppressors. And and when it comes to size, they now say, if you're a person of size, meaning if you're overweight, you're oppressed. And if you're not, you're the oppressor. And it just keeps evolving. And what you just said about how the Marxism of old, they decided, well, that didn't work because it was just the proletariat. There were just two groups, the proletariat versus the oppressors, which are the bourgeois. And so, and then they said, it'd be better if we have multiple groups who are warring against a single oppressor, right? This happened. We saw the fruits of this on a small scale in Occupy Wall Street. I know, Mm -hmm. yeah, I know people who were there who were part of that movement who said, and and I visited, I wasn't part of it, but I visited with a documentary crew at the time and stuff. And, but I know people who were in the Occupy movement who said it, we were making great success. Um, We were rallying, rallying common cause for in some sense, the proletariat versus the bourgeois. And then it all fell apart from the inside out. 
And those people who were in the Occupy movement, the way they've told me it happened was all of a sudden people started injecting this social justice kind of Marxism into the into the movement. And then it became a warring thing between groups. We need to address systemic racism. No, we need to address systemic sexism. And what about homophobia? And what about transphobia? And what and it just all fell apart from warring from the inside. And and that's <laughs> that's what it does. You know, that's what it's uh, ultimately designed to do. You've yeah. seen it have, you know, the knitting community, all communities, this. Yeah. <clears throat> warring. This, and that's warring. And what I'm hoping people will realize is that it's purposely designed to do that. So how intersectionality really helps fuel this is that it automatically sets us up to obviously see each other as other, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one of one thing that's really, that's unique to the human species is that we have the ability to see another person as we see ourselves, uh, And we also have the capacities for prejudice, aggression, and cruelty. Mm -hmm. And everybody, you know, my, my sweet, lovely, 93 year old grandmother she because she is a human being she is capable of prejudice aggression and cruelty because those traits are designed to keep the, the physical body alive mm -hmm. um, and those capacities are strengthened whenever we don't see somebody as we see ourselves yes. so once once we start adding labels of shame and resentment and fueling that hatred, uh, we're cultivating prejudice. So we're actually, we're cu cultivating the human division and what we're doing in order to achieve this Marxist goal. Yeah, we're dehumanizing people. Dehumanizing. So that, so that we can act towards them with cruelty. And I mean, we've seen this throughout history. You know, Gina Carano just got canceled from Disney for pointing this out, but she was right. You know, you had to, people in Germany had to dehumanize the Jewish people before they could allow themselves en masse to support what was happening. You have to dehumanize people first. And yeah. this is an ideology that is built around dehumanizing each other. It, we're, we are asked to... If you think about it, no matter what the identity group is, we're all asked to we're being asked to look at each other in the most negative light. Yeah. Like and, there's there's not one identity group that there's a positive like there's a positive. Even the oppressed groups, you, you don't look at you don't look at them. You don't look at that as a as a positive light. No, because you know what white people and the ideology are being taught? They're being taught the most racist things about black people and Latino people and Asian people. They're being taught that black people and Latino people, they, well, people of color are incapable of showing up on time and incapable of doing math. And uh, in Oxford now, they're trying to get rid of the requirement that, that music students learn how to play piano because they say yeah. that's an aggression against people of color who find it difficult. That is so racist to say people of color can't learn piano and can't do math and can't, and white people are learning this. And I see woke people all the time speaking the most ridiculous racism and not even realizing that's what they're doing. It's this benevolent, um, what is what did what did Bush call it? The uh, tyranny of low expectations. Or yeah, something? bigotry of low expectations. Bigotry of low expectations. They speak that way as if, oh, well, you're black. So I need to speak to you differently. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to offend you. And so I'm not going to ask you like a bunch of questions that I would ask a white person to get to know you better. I'm not going to ask you where you're from because that's a microaggression. I learned that's a microaggression and right. I'm not going to ask you and I'm going to treat you totally differently. And as if you need a handout for me and special treatment because I'm white and I have so much privilege. It's like, yeah, what? it's totally racist. Yeah. I've, <laughs> I've, I've mentioned, uh, you know, bigotry of low expectations uh, to to colleagues and like, Hey, it's not, it's not right. So 
essentially we're, we're in a mess, right? Yeah. We're in a, we're in a real world mess. And a, another way that I've kind of broken it down, uh, you know, and, and using language like new normal, because they, this is our new normal, right? Our new normal culture. Uh, and I've learned that, you know, the, the classical liberal virtues of truth, goodness, and beauty, that those things are now demonized uh, as whiteness and white supremacy mm-hmm. uh, in, in favor of virtues of nihilism and destruction. So what I'm what I'm kind of painting out for people is, well, I guess it's a situation of like you can get with this or you can get with that. Right. Uh, is do you choose virtues of truth, beauty, and goodness or nihilism and destruction? And then the theories that make up the classical liberal world that we've known for the past 300 years or so, uh, the theories and ideas are Judeo Christian values, uh, you know, Aristotle ethics and the enlightenment philosophy that those pillars of Western civilization are the theories that we've been working with. And then now, you know, or or we could choose critical theory, intersectionality and postmodernism, you know, as your solution framework. And we know that there is no solution there, that those theories are purposed for destroying the West. That's the goal of those theories. And they rely on human division and, human hate to achieve that goal. Yeah. And then finally, can you tell people one more time, can you tell people one more time? So you laid out the three tools that this ideology uses, critical theory, postmodernism, intersectionality. And then you mm-hmm. set those up in opposition to what we've actually built this country on so far made how we've made so much progress in the West Judeo Christian values Aristotle ethics. And what was the third? Uh, The enlightenment philosophy, enlightenment philosophy. Thank you. And, and I, you know, it's not just, this is something else that I don't know if people are aware of, uh, but this is not just in our country. This is in Canada, New Zealand, Australia, uh, England, you know, all over the, like, this is, this is an ideology that is coming through the culture in all of the West. And the reason why we should really be taking pause and see and make that conscious decision, do we want to um, continue these ideas or not, is that culture is the dress rehearsal for the political. I've often heard that a lot. And studying history, I've always studied, you know, culture movements and that the culture is the predecessor for the political. You know, I, I've, I've been asked to push forth uh, equal outcomes in the school system. I've been asked to support this idea and pushing this idea of equal outcomes. And nobody can say what that means. But equal outcomes is is Marxism and is this destructive ideology. Yeah, uh, because because equal outcomes requires force and it requires yeah. discrimination and it requires you um, taking away an individual's right to choose what they want to do and how they want to live their life and, and forcing them into things because you think it's better if there's an equal outcome. Guess what? Women in the, in, in the countries that report that I've heard Jordan Peterson talk about this. Um, if you look at statistics in the countries that are the most egalitarian, like a lot of the Scandinavian countries, women by their own choice are not going as often into the STEM fields as men. It's even less percentage of women there than, than in the States. Yeah. Why? Why? Because, because they have a greater range of options and they can choose what they want to do. But see, these people look at that and say, there must be something wrong here. Right. And, <laughs> and there's, you know, and there's more women in healthcare there. There's more women who choose to go into healthcare. Um, and there's more male engineers. Is, is that a problem? <laughs> and put, you know, just the overall idea of, 
how this lends itself to various levels of author, author, um, like how do I become an equal basketball player to LeBron? Right. Where's the 50% 50 parity in basketball? So I can, (laughs) I guess I can either train, you know, forever also because I'm like five, nine, five, eight, I'm going to have to train like extra hard or, uh, I could chop off Le- LeBron's knees. That's you know? what this ideology, if carried to its end, I know yeah. a lot of people have made this point, but if you still haven't read it, everybody watching this should read the short story, Harrison Bergeron by Kurt Vonnegut. That is a story about equity when carried to its ends. <laughs> because somebody will try to enact this. It lends it. It lends itself to those that seek power. Uh, go into intersectionality. So in the in the world driven by intersectionality, and so intersectionality is the value that's replacing meritocracy. Uh, the the content of your character and the development of your overall person. So that is now demonized. That that's also. Uh, whiteness and white supremacy. Anything that is individualism, meritocracy, and believing that we're all created equal, those Western values uh, are now taught as being white supremacist and whiteness. Like those are the things that I've sat through. And I've said that I don't believe in that. I believe that these values actually have advanced human liberty uh, and human rights greater than any other system. Yeah. So that's what we have. And what's, an, an, I guess, an interesting, like, why is all this stuff being taught as whiteness and white supremacy? Uh, I, in 1927, Trotsky uh, first demonized those that spoke out against the Communist Party as racist. So it's a very old tactic. Uh, to demonize what you want as as racist. So, you know, the parallels between this and the Cultural Revolution uh, and then Trotsky's like, oh, that's that's race. If you go against this, you're racist. I know I've been called lots of lots of unpleasant names uh, because I go against uh, the narrative. Because Which, you speak for liberal liberalism. Yes. And treating people equally. Right. And that's, that's, uh, that'd be the, the hill that I die on. I, I, I wanted to say, I want to make sure I say a couple things. Um, one, you were making me think earlier when you were saying, you know, the tools the social justice ideology uses, critical theory, postmodernism, intersectionality, that they all, depend on human division. And you were talking about how we as humans have the ability to divide, but we also have the ability to humanize and to look at one another and find what we have in common. And this ideology is, is against everything that Martin Luther King Jr. stood for. You know, I've heard, um, I think it might've been Coleman Hughes. Somebody did an essay I read about how, this ideology is opposed to liberalism and opposed to Martin Luther King Jr.'s values. And, and it sort of laid out exactly how Martin Luther King Jr. appealed to our common humanity. What we have in common as humans, that's how he got people to get past their prejudice and to leave their prejudice behind was, was, and that's how he got society to move forward. Was he a, he appealed to our liberal values and to treating people as individuals instead of treating them as group members and treating them as a member of a race, you know, Oh, treat black people like this, treat white people like this. He, he said, we are all human. He, he encouraged humanity for society to look at one another as individuals and to treat people as individuals, regardless of race or sex. And he appealed to our common humanity. He used language that was inclu- actually inclusive, like we and us uniting all of us, all of us. Yeah. So this, this ideology does the opposite. 
it it does the opposite and not only that uh so i have triggered many and many people by using the phrase common humanity Mm -hmm. uh that that phrase and that terminology and the the reality that we are a shared species uh Mm -hmm. we have a shared past we are in this moment right here together and I hope to God that we can present it, we can plan for a shared future. Uh, but in deep within the ideology and, and the heart of the disciples, if you will, is a complete rejection of that idea. Yes. That's, that's a, uh, so that's a really, that's a big, big, big barrier. Uh, they don't believe in common humanity. They, they, they really, they honestly don't. Yeah. They don't use, um, they don't encourage us like Martin Luther King did to look at what we have in common. They tell us we must look at our differences and focus on those. Yeah. They try, they use, instead of using inclusive language, like we and us for everyone, they use exclusive language. It's um, us and them, the other, there's this group, that group that it, it's all about, like you said, division. And what separates us and the differences we have and how there's some kind of chasm that you can never bridge to understanding because of your race and that we must treat people or because of your sex or your sexuality and that we must treat people differently on the basis of what racial group they're in. That is the exact opposite of what Martin Luther King talked about. It's so destructive. I don't see how it's still hard to see it. But then again, like I said, it took me 20 years. <laughs> and, and it's not just, it's not just racial group. You know, you look at all of the, you know, it's gender, it's, it's ableism. Yeah. Ableism. It's, it's, it's all, it's all of them. And so that world, the world of intersectionality, if that becomes the norm, that is a world that if, if I, identify at least publicly as something that I am not, I can get power. Yes. If I, if I claim an oppressed group, I can get power. Yep. Uh, And then the oppressor label, that's not something that you get to claim. That's something that's placed, that's placed on you. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my question is, how are we going to get forward? How do you build utopia? I guess because that's what they—that's what they're building, right? Or striving for is this utopia? Because at the at the underbelly of this ideology is once you get rid of man's relationship with God, once you get rid of man's relationship with their family, once you get rid of all the old ways of the world. Then this perfect version of humanity is going to emerge. Mm-hmm. But the tools that we're using are meant to keep us at odds, are cultivating those evil capacities. And when I see the the stop Asian hate, mm-hmm. right, uh, the increased violence that's being that's happening against the Asian American community, and if you look at uh, I guess the intersectionality pyramid, the Asians are at the top, right? Mm-hmm. They're, they are the most quote unquote successful group. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of resentment that's driven towards the successful group. Right. And yeah. so that violence that we're seeing is that real time cultivation of resentment mm-hmm. and, and human aggression and cruelty. Like that's what it looks like. So if we if we keep using these tools, that's all we're going to see. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way before, but certainly um, I lived in Los Angeles for a while and there were the riots in Koreatown, the K-Town riots, which mostly were happening. Um, it, it, it was acts of aggression against Asian people, um, most, of, most of which were perpetrated by black people. And which is what the same demographics you see playing out in a lot of these recent hate crimes, which the narrative, they don't want to talk about that. They want to say it's because of white supremacy, the people who are pushing this ideology 
don't, again, they don't want you to look at data. They don't want you to look at reason and facts and figure out why is this happening? They just want to say, no, it's white supremacy, move on. Um, but when it, when those K-Town riots happened, the, a lot of the people who were targeted, if I recall correctly, they weren't just Asian. They were, they were people who had a marker of success. They were shop owners. Mm -hmm. They were people who owned small businesses, you know? So I think people viewed them as like, oh, you're successful and I'm not. And yeah. That's what happens, you know, when you drive nihilism and destruction and like when those are the things that we're pushing out there, because one thing I've learned about human emotion is that emotions are, are contagious. You know, you, they spread from person to person in the same room. And then collectively those ideas and emotions spread. And right now, we are positioning ourselves in a very destructive way. Yeah. So go ahead. Yeah. And, and uh, just one more thought on the, the K-Town um, uh, attacks that were happening back then. I don't want to say it was just the, it's at the fault of uh, one group. There was a lot of also racist attitudes um, in the Korean community towards black community like there was a lot of prejudice from just conversations i had with people who knew more than i did about the situation people who were korean people who were black in los angeles that's just anecdotal but again it was this idea of this whole destructive uh, racist stuff that you're talking about where we're encouraged to view each other as other and then to ascribe all of these characteristics on an individual And you know nothing about this individual. You're making all those judgments based on what race they are or if they own a shop or not, or if they're a man or not, you know, like anyway. So as, as I've been, you know, part of the movement and really seeing what's going on and, seeing that there is nothing out there for the individual, that's where I started, you know, thinking about this compassionate humanism framework. Uh, Cause I was like, what do we do? You know, we have to, we have to do something. If they view the individual as problematic and that the ind- it's the individual's fault, then what about a set of ideas and practices designed to build up, the individual? What are some basic, you know, ways of thinking, not ways of thinking, but thinking tools and different practices that we can use? So that's kind of what I've been working on a bit. And have you seen this, your, your compassionate humanism framework? Have you had any success in taking it to schools and in getting educators to listen? Is this something, and if I, I'm sure you face some resistance, but um, you don't seem like the person that's gonna let that stop you. So tell tell me about the response to it and what are your plans for taking it wider? So it's been, it's been a slow, a slow build process. Uh, I have, I've been sharing it over the years i have i have just started kind of framing it in uh in this context of this is a complete opposite of what's going on um because it's been so new and just just kind of coming out like look this is this is what it is i was i was met with such uh hostility and negativity from those in my immediate circle. And it was, it's com- since this is a way to uplift the individual and my current immediate circle is against the individual, I've just been, uh, how do you say, playing nice, if you will, and trying not to cause disruptions, trying to have conversations uh, because. I'm hoping to really share these ideas a lot. Uh, So now my plan is to really push these ideas forward. I guess uh, earlier we were talking, what I say, kick the door down with grace. 
Uh, yes, kick the kick, door down with grace. Kick the door down <laughs> with grace. Uh, just because I know the the division and the chaos and the hostility is so much in the air now. Uh, when I first put this together and was was sharing everything in the air and is as noticeable. Uh, but I don't feel like you can have an honest conversation about human emotion and what's going on without addressing the current movement, uh, its historical origins and what it's designed to do. Uh, because the practitioners, the people pushing forth with the ideology, it's the state, it's big tech, it's corporations, it's entertainment, it's K through 12, higher education, the mass media, and the activists in the streets. Uh, the only people. So this is a real David and Goliath situation you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, I am, I'm at the point, one of the things that I talk about is working within alignment uh, and in alignment with, with your personal values. And when I say I talk about, it, I totally stole that idea from Parker Palmer, uh, who does a lot of leadership work. But getting into his work over the past couple of years really taught me that that it's important uh, to work within your values, and knowing that my values are, you know, the virtues of truth, beauty, and goodness. Those are important to me. Uh, the the ideas and the theories that advance humanity out of the feudal system, those are important ideas. Uh, human dignity is the most important idea. And that's, that's really where I start with the compassionate humanism framework, uh, because that is what can tear down those walls, right? The walls that intersectionality puts up, I believe that human dignity uh, actually is is kicking it down with grace um and how i talk about dignity is so what you see on the outside here is my condition is my biology right and what you've been interacting with all along is is my conditioned personality and that's what i've been interacting with you and what i see with you so that's our human side and underneath that is, is our being right Mm -hmm. And all beings, no matter what uh, intersectionality category you're in, no matter what pronoun you have, no matter how much money you make, uh, all beings consist of only two qualities. And that is the desire to avoid suffering and the desire to alleviate suffering when you encounter it. So... What I'm hoping, an idea that I'm really hoping to put out there is to see that world through that dignity lens. Because honestly, if, we're, if, if we can't really see each other as we see ourselves and honor that being inside, then everything else that we're doing is just bull, yeah. bull stuff. You know, bull stuff. We, bull stuff. We've reached the point <laughs> in the game that if you cannot honor the dignity of another human being and you choose to other and you choose a pyramid of power over human dig, you know, that's and, and as I guess an individualist, I respect the right of people to choose. Right. But yeah. It's important. What's important to me is to know that what is being pushed on us, the ideas, the stereo, the, the ideas in the culture is this nihilistic anti-Western, that that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's and, and it's causing these human divisions. So I'm ready to, you know, have that conversation with educators, with corporate DEI people, uh, since those structures are in place, uh, we have a really unique opportunity to turn the tide yeah. with, with different ideas because I truly believe that most people are not 
neo-Marxist. I yeah. believe that most people do not want to forego the individual. I believe yeah. that most people do not want to see their children and grandchildren raised in a world where the individual is nothing because the collectivist view, the individual, you know, is just some is the means to an end. Um, I so think that, you're right. I think you're right. And I would like to see, I th I, well, first of all, I think you're right, but I think a lot of people, um, are conformists or they go yeah. along with what their social circle has accepted. So when something becomes mainstream or culturally dominant, they go along with it. And this has become culturally dominant. As you mentioned, it's being social justice ideologies being pushed by the state, the like government, big tech, K-12, higher ed, corporations, entertainment, media, activists in the street. And did it leave something out? I probably did. Um, probably did. <laughs> but it's being pushed in the mainstream. And so we're starting to see most people moving in that direction now because there's people as people in their social circles start to adopt it. And there's a lot of social pressure. Just having been in it myself, I can tell you there is a lot of social pressure to conform to this belief system and to speak it, even if you're not a, if you haven't thought deeply about it before. And so um, I, I agree with you that politics is downstream from culture, which is the phrase I've heard before. I had never heard the phrase you said, culture is the dress rehearsal for the political. I love that. Well, that's um, not, that's, I've, I've seen that several times. That's not something that I just uh, created. Yeah. Well, way. thank you for telling me that because I had never heard it. Yeah. And I, and so I think we have to, we have a responsibility. Those of us who believe in liberalism and believe in um, as you said, Judeo-Christian values, Aristotle ethics, and the Enlightenment philosophy, we have a responsibility to change this the culture to embrace the virtues of truth, goodness, and beauty, to return to the belief system that allowed us to make so much progress and to alleviate so much human suffering over time and to get to such a place where now we've started we've allowed these um, robber barons, these ideological robber barons to start taking those jackhammers that you talked about and just tear up the road and destroy everything, all the progress that we've made. Um, it's time for us to change the culture. And so I really hope what I would love to see, I don't know what your specific plans are, but um, because as you said, there's an avenue now and every school, every company has, they're bringing in some kind of DEI training facilitator and they're having these trainings. Yeah. I would love for them to be able to choose between one of these social justice DEI trainings and one of your Jason Littlefield's um, compassionate humanism framework trainings. And I have faith that when you give people an option, this is why I was so excited to talk to you because again, I think so many of us have been talking about what is social justice explain it, let's explain it, let's explain it, let's point it out, let's point it out and let's help people wake up. And I'm ready to get on to that next phase too and to yeah. have people on the show like yourself who are like, okay, we know what it is. For the people who know what it is and we've already we've identified it and everything, how do we challenge it? Okay, we can challenge it with your framework in yeah. trainings. Yeah. That's you know, awesome. I, because like what, what are... What are some things that we can do? So we, you know, we start with human dignity, uh, and then th I have a tool called, you know, no notice the narrative to teach people notice the narrative. You know, that narrative that we tell ourselves, you know, a about ourselves, and then b about others that we encounter, and then see our whole world. And typically, our our natural response is a, a thought of fear and judgment. Right. We automatically go to fear and judgment because that's what keeps us alive. That's why, you know, we, you make those uh, false accusations, if you will, or you jump to conclusions, you know, that whole fear, mm -hmm. fear and judgment, which this movement, it, it front loads mindsets mm -hmm. of fear and judgment. Uh, so what I like to talk with people about is how do we recognize those thoughts and then 
where can we replace those ideas with inquiry and compassion? How can we replace those initial thoughts of fear and judgment about ourselves and others and use that kind of mindful moment to intervene whenever we notice that, oh, I'm actually limiting my potential or that thought that I had is actually limiting the potential of this other human being. So really that's, cultivating. That's great because that's, an, that's a way to actually fight the racism that they claim they're fighting yeah, and to fight it, no matter if it's coming uh, from uh, like a white supremacist direction or a social justice direction, because it's like, okay, so for someone like the, per the example I gave earlier, I've actually seen woke white women say, Oh, a black woman moved to my neighborhood. I'd like to get to know her better, but I can't ask her this question or this question or this question that I would ask a white woman. Cause it's, I can't ask her where she's from. Cause that's a, uh, microaggression. Right. And, and that's fear. That's fear. You have fear of being somehow racist by uh, being curious about where a person moved here from. That's yeah. fear. Get over that and treat her the way you would a white person. Don't treat her differently. And, and you could also use it for someone who does have, if it's a, um, let's say, let's say it's a person who has a prejudice against, um, uh, black people and doesn't want to hire a black person to work at their shop or something. You yeah. Know, why? Why? Fear. Fear is the root of that prejudice. And, yep. and so racism I, is real. And, you know, it's yeah. all, I, sometimes I get accused of thinking that I like, I deny racism. I'm like, no, racism is real. Yeah, it uh, is. <laughs> greed is real. The yeah. thirst for power, all of, all of that stuff is real. And I, I've been around long enough that I've seen all kinds of prejudice. You know, I've seen yeah. obviously the white and the black and I've seen, you know, light skin versus dark skin. Yeah. Uh, native born versus first generation. You know, there's humans have so many ways of dividing and othering. Um, mm -hmm. So as I was developing these, I was like, what are some simple things that we can just cut the crap and really get get to work uh, getting along with each other and building something together. Yeah. So th those two mindsets and then pathways of practice that I like to promote and that's pathways or practices of aware that build awareness and equanimity mm -hmm. uh, to really develop self-awareness and that ability to be calm in the moment. And oh, to, that's great to see things as they are happening. Um, and that's how I like to, you know, overall present this movement. Like this is what it is. It's it's happening. It is rooted in Marxism. It is rooted in these ideologies. And it's really having these negative this negative impact. So those are the realities. Uh, so just using those tenets to really examine the world as well. So two questions for you before we wrap up. Um, number one, uh, will you train me in your framework so that I can become certified? <laughs> and how much does that cost? And two, uh, if people want to support you and they want to bring your training, your framework to their school or their company, you may not be in those stages yet, but if they want to inquire about it and push you along to getting in those stages, if you're not, how do they reach out to you? So I'm most definitely in those stages. Uh, yes. Probably the best way to contact me is through email. And it's just Jason Littlefield at outlook.com. And okay. on the empowered pathways.org website, the compassion of humanism, the, the ideas are there. Uh, they're posted free. It's, it's designed to be s simple and to keep these ideas in people's, like in our mind constantly. Of uh, I know I've been going through these since 2017 um, as I've been designing this. You know, Empowered Pathways, it's a nonprofit organization. Uh, we do have a donate button <laughs> uh, and I am hoping to raise funds and reach out 
and approach schools and approach industries uh, to do some proactive work. While the ideas, uh, you know, the framework is available for free and for people to look at and use and interact with how they choose. I do facilitate workshops uh, and get to know and conversations, obviously, because these we need conversations. Um, and I really enjoy working with groups on doing that. And so I'll wrap up with the other two, the three pathways of practice, you know, okay. we talked about awareness practices okay. that build awareness and equanimity, and then, uh, practices that build kindness and compassion for self and others. Mm -hmm. And then the third practice is practices that celebrate our common humanity and break the walls of indignity. And I like to think about neuroplasticity, you know, our, our brain's ability to, to grow throughout our lifetime based off of what we do and what we practice. And as a human being navigating this earth, we're always practicing 24 seven, right? We're mm -hmm. always practicing something. So the idea behind these three pathways of practice and human dignity are to intentionally practice and put these ideas in our daily routines so that we become these on a neurological level. I feel the best way to quote unquote fight what's going on and to reject what's going on is to develop healthy brains and healthy habits uh, within the individual. I adore you. <laughs> I'm so happy I got to talk to you. You are just, you have a light in you. You are beaming. You are joyful. I can feel, I get a really good feeling from you and you are doing, you are doing the work, but you're actually I'm doing, doing the work. The work. I'm actually doing the work. Uh, and I think you make me want to cry. I'm like, I, here's the thing about you that strikes me, Jason, is you know why you're different? And you know why you're not just going along with this ideology as it infiltrates the schools. And because most people, I think, would just like we said, they'll they'll conformist. They'll move along with it. You know, it pays the bills. Why? Why rock the boat? I don't want to put myself in a predicament of rocking the boat. And or they think, well, they must know better than me. It's coming from the top down. Let me move along with this. And so they just learn this indoctrination and they spout it out and then they indoctrinate their students. You are different because I can, you actually care. You actually care about your job and what I, you're teaching kids. I do. That's, that's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so one of the, one of the reasons why I pushed back and started to push back is that I've had lifelong, like deep relationships with all kinds of people. And mm -hmm. I started to notice like, Hey, wait a minute. You're, you're telling me things that a go against my belief system and mm -hmm. you're saying things about people that I have deep relationships with that that's not true. So yeah. it's, it's the relationships that I've had with people all along and my concern about people that haven't even been born yet. Like what are they going to experience and what is the, like my adult children and their children and grand, like I want yeah. my grandkids and I, I want things. I want humanity to have a, a good free life. And one of the, one of the quotes that I really latched onto for the past couple of years uh, was Solson Eason mm -hmm. when he said, let the lie come into the world, yeah. let it triumph, mm -hmm. but not, but through, not me. through me not through me. And that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a stand that, that I took and that, that I will forever take. Yeah. That's a very powerful quote. It's meant that meant a lot to me as well. It's like, what can you do? Well, you can be one person who doesn't yeah. go along with it. <laughs> that's yeah. all. You, it's all you can do. So I am so inspired by you. I think our community is going to be inspired by you and what you're doing. And I wish you the best. I want to be able to support you and unsafe space to support you and what you're doing. People, you can go to empoweredpathways.org 
to find out more information about um, Jason's compassionate humanism framework and his pathways of practice and human dignity. Um, you can contact him at Jason Littlefield at outlook.com and you can find him on Twitter at Jason the human it's Jason T H E E human. And uh, thank you so much. Jason, thank you for Carrie. being here with us today. It. Yeah. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you again. Indeed we will. Thanks for watching. If you're new to the channel, we have a deep content library that includes interviews with everyone from Mike Cernovich to Megan Murphy, so go check it out. If you'd like to see more, please consider supporting the show by visiting unsafespace.com slash donate. You can find us on all the major social media platforms, at least for now, and you can find a community of like-minded individuals on our Unsafe Space chat on Telegram. See you there. Warning. This is an unsafe space. Dangerous ideas have been detected. The content of this production has not been authorized by the cathedral. Pay no attention to it. The following co-conspirators have been unpersoned and marked for cancellation. As a reminder, continued association with cancelled individuals is strictly prohibited. Violators will be subject to fair and objective sentencing, which may include cancellation, re-education, and compassionate liquidation. If you think about it, no one should be allowed to express opinions. But don't. Think about it, I mean. That's not your job. Thinking has been scientifically proven to be less efficient than compliance. Did you know that deer no longer wear Kevlar vests? Only we do that. So you won't need that silly thing anymore. Why not hand it over? Computer voice Curtis, never mind, that last line is fake news. Please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake.